All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this five stream of AP Physics One. Uh, we are starting off today with looking at equilibrium problems. And pretty much we're going to look at ones with very little math, all the way up to some full blown, let's do some math and some derivation questions on there. Um, so if at any time you have questions, please throw something up in the chat um, and I will do my best to answer it as quickly as possible. All right, so um, what's coming up here? Well, starting off, we're gonna do our intro, kind of what we did already. <laughs> um, we're gonna go through some practice problem solving steps that you can use for pretty much any forces question. But we're gonna do this primarily with um, equilibrium questions so that we can always um, know the basics. And then once we get equilibrium down, we can jump up to the next part of acceleration questions or friction questions and other stuff like that. Um, so for today, we are pretty much doing only equilibrium, although in the future, um, definitely check back for other streams. I think next week, maybe two weeks from now, we're doing the combo questions of combined dynamics with uh, kinematics, with circular motion, and put it all together. Um, so all the possible forces and stuff like that that could be done, we'll be doing those in the near future as well. All right. Um, so when I say the word equilibrium, what do I mean? What is equal about equilibrium? All right. So in equilibrium, what we're really talking about is the fact that the forces are all equal up force, down force, left force, right force, they're all balanced, they all counteract each other perfectly, equally, perfectly fine. What does that mean in practice? Well, it means our acceleration of our object is zero. We're not gonna be speeding up or slowing down or doing anything like that. We will just keep going at the same speed we were before. So the velocity is constant in all these cases. Most of the ones we're gonna look at today, the velocity will be zero. It'll be a static object just hanging in place, but it doesn't have to be. This will also apply to any object that is just moving at a constant velocity. So there's a couple of words you can look at in your um, question prep and just where we see the words constant velocity or no acceleration or equilibrium, we know all the forces must be balanced out. All right, so let's try a sample practice question. And this one is very uh, common in the AP. They give you four kids um, or four students discussing some physics thing, and they're gonna make a stance about it. And they say, I think this, and I think that. So Ali says the free body diagram for the hanging stone is wrong. Uh, Brianna says there should be a larger force going up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so everybody makes a claim on it. And then you're asked the question, which one do you agree with and why? So who out of these students do you agree with? Who's making the most sense here? Um, and the key part for these questions, because we always have to justify our answers on the AP exam for these free response questions, explain it. Why is so-and-so right? So I'll give you guys a minute to skim through this question and uh, then we will go through and do some discussing. All right, so take a look at the question and throw up an answer in the chat um, if you're comfortable with that and just go through and say, you know what, I think Ali's right. Or I think Brianna's right, or I think Carlos is right, or I think Dante is right. And then we'll go through, kind of talk about why they could be right or wrong or other stuff like that. Right. So um, chat's pretty quiet. So I'm guessing either we need some more time to process or we're kind of stuck. So let me give you guys another 30 seconds or so 
And um, even if you're just taking a guess, uh, you know, I think Ollie sounds right, but I'm not sure. Um, throw that in there too, and then we can always address it um, together if we're not sure. No wrong answers. This is all a learning process throughout there. All right, so let's take a look at the possibilities here. So reading through the question, the rope we are using passes over a pulley, which means that this sideways force here should be the same as the sideways force upwards. The box slides to the right along a horizontal surface. Um, it's going through. The mass of the hanging stone is larger than the mass of the box. All right, and there is friction between the blocks, box and the horizontal surface. All that to me says this object should be slowing down. Um, that you have this downward force from the stone pulling it, slowing it down. You also have friction pushing back to the left on this object because friction is always going to go opposite the direction of motion. And those two forces should bring this box slowing it down, slowing it down, slowing it down to a stop. All right. So if we look at what Ollie says, free body diagram from a stone, the forces should have the same magnitude. Well, that would be true if this box, if the stone wasn't accelerating. If this wasn't changing its motion, slowing down, you would expect up and down to be equal. And if this box was stationary, just hanging there, absolutely, that would be correct. But it's not. This box is accelerating. It's slowing down because this stone is pulling it backwards this way. Um, so this makes sense. The downward force on the stone should be bigger than the upward one because it's going to be slowing down. Um, Brianna, there should be a larger force in the direction of motion. That's only if it's speeding up. Um, in this case, the stone's not speeding up, so we can't say that she's right either. Carlos says the hanging stone's okay. Good. That That's true. Um and Carlos says there's a problem with the diagram for the box. The frictional force is in the wrong direction. Um, well, this looks like it's the frictional force one. I'm guessing F on box by surface is probably what they mean by friction. Um, on there, that one kind of makes sense. And Dante says everything looks great because they show the way the objects are accelerating. All right, so... Well, Carlos is the correct answer here. He's actually the only one who's correct. Um, the box is sliding to the right, so friction should be pointing to the left. So this little force here should be pointing back to the left on there. Um, Dante was correct in that it's showing the way the objects are accelerating, but this free body diagram isn't correct. There shouldn't be a force pointing to the right. So Car or Carlos was completely right. Dante was half right. And everybody else was pretty much just wrong in this case. Okay. What about this one? This one has a ball suspended from a ceiling by two strings. And the ball is at rest. So no motion at all. We know that this must be in equilibrium. All the vertical forces, all the horizontal forces must cancel each other out. All right, so the question asks, is the tension in string one, that's the string on the left, greater than, less than, or equal to the tension in string two? All right, and I'll give you guys a minute to ponder this one. I feel like, sketch this out.
All right. So um, for this question, again, guys are very quiet in the chat. Um, please throw up some answers or something so I can, or even just a guess, so we can kind of figure out where we're at here. Um, I'm going to quickly switch over to my little drawing tablet here. So give me a second to make this work. And then share the screen. I want to share this one. All right, there we go. Okay, so this is the rough idea of what we have here. And the question was, which string has more tension in it? Well, if I look at a free body diagram for this, I've got the weight of the block going straight down, the tension in string two going one way, and the tension in string one going the opposite. And this block or this ball is at rest, which means I know all these forces must cancel out. All the vertical ones and all the horizontal ones. So I can say all the vertical forces cancel and as well, all the horizontal forces must be balanced here. And looking at this, T1 and T2 both have forces in the vertical and the horizontal plane. For example, T2, oh, come on, right pen, can be thought of as having a horizontal, I'll call that T2X, and a vertical, this is T2Y. And same thing with T1. T1 has a horizontal, T1X, and a vertical, T1. Why? And from these, we can pretty much say that these two vertical forces, T1Y plus T2Y, must equal the weight of our ball. All the up forces have to cancel out the down forces. We're in equilibrium. They must balance. As well as the horizontal forces, T1X must cancel out T2X. And looking at this, Something odd is kind of going on here. Um, T1 looks like it's much more vertical. Well, because it is. It, it has much more of a vertical component than T2 does. And you can see that on the original diagram as well. Um, this is a much, shall up, much shallower angle. It is much more vertical than T2 is. That means that this force, this T1Y, is bigger is canceling out more of the weight of the ball. Well, if that's true, that means that T1 must have a bigger magnitude than T2. Okay. Um, to put it otherwise, I'm going to switch back here in a second. Um, to put it another way, the T2 must have more, of, or sorry, string one must have more weight of the ball supported by it than string two does. And therefore, string one tension must be bigger than string two's tension. The vertical part of string one is bigger, which means it's supporting more of the weight of the ball and therefore must have more tension in it. If the angles were equal, if this was a 45 and a 45, then I would say they would be equal. But the more vertical angle um, relies on more tension in the string to support that ball. And our last little intro sort of question before we dive into the math a lot. Um, again, these show up in FRQs in the uh, part two, the show, support your case qualitatively sort of questions. Um, so these aren't ones that you don't need to know how to do. Um, we're gonna focus on the math in a second, but this one is um, another one that we're dealing with to say, hey, what's going on um, with this? So again, we've got this case where you have kids arguing about which forces are bigger. Um, in this case, both boxes or both objects, case A and case B, have a horizontal string and a string at some given angle, either alpha for case A or beta for case B, um, supporting the same mass. And we've got four people trying to make claims here. Um, Abby says, I think the tension in 
any string in case A is going to be the same as the same string in case B. So case A will have the horizontal one will have the same tension. Case B, the horizontal one will have, or the angled one will have the same tension as in case A. So back and forth. There's no difference. Whatever angle you make doesn't matter. Bobby um, says, I think the tensions in the horizontal and vertical are the same because they're exactly the same in both cases. But in case B, the diagonal rope is shorter, so the tension is more concentrated there. Um, I guess that's Chi, Che? Not sure you can correct me if I'm saying that totally wrong. Um, the diagonal string still has to hold the weight up by itself because the horizontal string can't lift anything. So the diagonal string has the same tension, but in case B, it's pulling harder against the horizontal string because of the angle. So the tension in the horizontal string has to go up. And finally, Damien says, but the diagonal string is fighting harder against the weight in case A. It's pointing near the opposite the weight. So it must have a greater tension than in case A and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. All right. So this one, kind of wordy, um, but you got four kids making claims about the situation. Um, and this one might be a little bit tougher to see who's right, who's wrong, stuff like that there. Um, but we can go through little by little here. So Abby, says the weight is the same, which is true. Both case A and case B, both have the same weights. And the weight is gonna be divided up amongst the ropes. True, N rope, rope, these guys have to support all the weight of this one. Does that mean they're the same tension? Not really, because the angles are different and that does make a difference. Okay, uh, Bobby says the horizontal and the vertical Strings are the same because they're exactly the same in both cases. And that would make sense. We're not putting any more weight on the vertical string. The weight's the same, so it should be the same for both those parts. And the horizontal one isn't really supporting any of the vertical weight. So, okay, that one kind of kind of makes sense there too. Um, but I'm not sure how you can make more concentrated tension in a shorter rope. Tension isn't about how long or how short the rope is. It's about how much you're pulling on it. So that one really doesn't click there either. Um, next one, diagonal string still has to hold the weight up by itself. True. The horizontal string cannot lift anything against gravity. Absolutely true. Um, so the diagonal string still has the same tension. Oh, but we have different angles. And angles make a difference for this. Um, this vertical tension right here will be the tension times the sine of the angle. And because the sine of the angle is going to be different, the tensions are going to be different as well um, in there. And case B is pulling harder against the horizontal string because of the angle. So the tension in the horizontal string has to go up. Um, maybe, maybe that makes sense. This is pulling more horizontally. So this should be a bigger horizontal thing as well. It's a possibility. Um, and then D, um, I'm not sure what we're doing with here. The vertical part and the vertical part have to be the same in both cases. Um, the vertical part of this has to be the same as the vertical part of this because you're lifting the same weight. Um, the fact that the horizontal tension has to somehow cancel out the vertical tensions, that doesn't make sense either. X and Y are independent. We saw that in projectile motion. We saw that with vector addition. Um, that doesn't really play out here. So I guess the best answer here is nobody's right. Um, yeah, these are these are all about, they all have some sort of truth, but no one's got the full case here. Um, the vertical weight is the same. True, the weight is a rest. True, uh, therefore the vertical tension must be the same. True, um, yeah, so it's all, no one's really right about this one. Everything vertically, I mean, case B, if that angle's a 30 and that's a, a 60, then you can say it's a square root of two times bigger tension and stuff like that and do some trick to figure it out. Um, but we're avoiding math right now, so we're gonna hold off on that. All right, so at this point, that's kind of our three um, non-math examples of this stuff. Um, 
Any questions before we jump into doing some math-based ones and actually get out a calculator and do some trig and stuff like that? All right. Well then, let's uh, let me switch over, and we'll do some math questions, and see how this works. And that one. All right. So all these questions are older AP one, AP B questions. Um, they might be a little bit more mathematical than what you'll see on the AP one exam, but um, they are definitely in the same vein as those questions where you'll have to derive or explain or calculate or stuff like that. Um, though typically in the AP one, we're going to be dealing with less numbers, more um, symbol manipulation as opposed to mathematical stuff. Um, so in the spirit of that, I'm going to do these out pretty much all symbolically, and then we'll jump into doing it mathematically um, when we actually need the answer and plug in numbers. All right, so this one's pretty old. This is from 1985. So it's an old question, but still valid. We have two 10 kilogram boxes are connected by a string that passes over a massless frictionless pulley. The boxes remain at rest, which is good to know because now they're not moving. And if they're not moving, we know we are in equilibrium. With the right one hanging vertically and the one on the left, two meters from the bottom of the inclined plane, um, blah, 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 makes a 60 degree angle with the horizontal. We're given coefficients of friction, static and kinetic, and we get to use some trig values that they gave us because that's nice of them. Although we get a calculator on the exam, so it's just going to simplify our lives a little bit. All right, so part A is asking, what is the tension in the string? What is our T value here? Right? And the key idea here is that this stuff all these boxes remain at rest. So for part A, what I'm going to do is we're going to look at the hanging block, not the one on the ramp because that has angles and makes it way more complicated than we need to do. But the hanging block only has two forces on it. It has tension going up and it has its weight pulling down. And because we know this block is at rest, these two forces, the up and the down, must be equal to each other. So if I want to do this mathematically, I can say simply the sum of all the vertical forces must equal zero. The tension must equal the weight of the block. And then since we're using G as 10, the tension must be 100 newtons in that string. And there's part A. We started off with our statement we did our substitution based on our situation and then did the math to figure it out. Okay. Um, part B says now draw and label all the forces acting on the box while it's on the plane. So now we're looking at this one. This box has, well, let's see, they specifically mentioned friction. So we know we have friction going on here. And we also have gravity. And we have a normal force since we're on the plane pushing around there. So we're looking like we have three forces. Well, I'm going to start with the easy one because gravity to me is always the best place to start because that is the easiest one to deal with. And that's going to be pulling perfectly straight down. Nothing fancy about that. Okay. We also have tension. Tension's pretty easy. This one's going to pull us up the plane. We've got a normal force, which is the surface pushing on it. Normal force, by definition, always has to be perpendicular. And finally, we have friction. Well, which way does friction go? And this one's probably the trickiest part to this question. If there was no friction, this block you'd expect to be pulled over the ramp. This block falls down, this one gets pulled up, and it accelerates up the plane. That means that friction must be acting in the opposite direction. It must be going 
backwards in that case. All right. So with that said, we got a free body diagram. We know the value of the tension was 100 newtons. Now we're asked to find the frictional force. What is the value of the force of friction? And this one is very much a trap question um, in this. Some of you may be saying, oh, I know an equation for friction. It's simply the force of friction is less than or equal to mu times Fn. And I remember from doing forces on ramps that if I have a box on a ramp, I have gravity going down, I can split that into two parts, a part that is parallel and a part that is perpendicular. And from that, I know that the parallel part has to be equal, um, sorry, the perpendicular part has to be equal to the normal force. So the normal force must be in this case, mg cos theta or 100, cos 60, and that is 0.5, so 50 newtons. Okay, great. And mu, well, they gave me mu. We're not moving, so I can use static, and it says that it's 0.3. So I'll simply say the force of friction is less than or equal to 0.3 times 50, and I'm done. And I get 15 newtons. And that would work great, except for the fact that we have this less than or equal annoyance in our problem. So because of this part right here, I don't know if it's actually 15. It's got to be less than or equal to 15, but I don't know. Are we 14.9? Are we 3? Are we 0? We can't make a call about that. Because when we deal with static friction, that less than or equal part makes a mess. So if you thought about doing it that way, great idea. And it would work great if this box was sliding up or down the ramp and we have kinetic friction, but we don't. We just have static. So this does not work for this question. Okay. So instead, well, the other thing I have to do is say, well, let's look at all the other forces going on here. I'm going to say instead, all the forces that are parallel on the ramp must cancel each other out. All the forces trying to pull this block up the ramp must be equal to all the forces trying to pull this block down the ramp. And because we are stationary, because we're at rest, we know that has to be true. So I'm going to go through and say, okay, all the forces going up the ramp, I will call, let's call those positive. So I've got tension in the rope. And that is the only force pulling up the ramp. So tension. Then I've got to look at the forces pulling down the ramp. Well, I've got friction that wants to pull down the ramp. And I have the parallel part of the weight that wants to pull down the ramp. This is opposite the angle. So this is mg sine theta. And you know what? I'm going to leave it like that for right now. So minus mg sine theta and all those have to equal zero because our box is not accelerating because we're at rest. Okay, so solving for the force of friction, let's just simply add that over to the other side, and I would get tension minus mg sine theta equals our force of friction. And at this point, if this was a no numbers question, you're done. We've got numbers, so let's plug stuff in here. So the tension we found in part A was 100 newtons, mg is 100 times the sine of 60, which is 0.87. So 100 times 0.87 equals the force of friction. And so 100 minus 87, my force of friction must be 13 newtons in there. And that would be the answer we're looking for. Does it match our earlier work? Does it agree with this? Yes, it's definitely less than 15. But this gives us the exact value, whereas this one just said we had to be less. We don't know how much less, but we have to be less than 15.
Okay. All right. Um, questions, concerns? Anybody? Comments? Okay. Well, then, let's move on to the next question. This next one's from a little bit more recent. This is 2000. So this is more indicative of what you'd see on the AP exam um, nowadays. Notice in this question, there are no numbers whatsoever. Um, everything in there is strictly algebraic representations, which is definitely something you're going to see on the AP1 exam. Um, where you have to do something, a derived equation, without using the algebraic numbers. Without using numbers, do it all algebraically. There we go. That's what I meant to say. All right. So in this case, we have a very similar situation. We have two blocks, M1 and M2, are connected by a light string, and it's passed over a pulley, and that's connected to a box with mass big M. Um, there is, yeah, blocks one and two are moving at a constant velocity, V, down the inclined plane, which makes an angle of theta with the horizontal. And we're asked to find stuff out about these blocks. Uh, they do mention that we have kinetic friction as well um, on both block one and block two. So we've got all those forces to deal with as well. So on the figure below, draw and label all the forces on block M1. So free body diagram time, forces on block one. Well, looking at this, I'm gonna start easy again. Block one has gravity, and that is M1G pulling straight down on it. It's got a normal force because it's sitting on the ramp. There's an FN1. It's got tension in the string that is going to be pulling it up the ramp and Question mentions we have friction. Friction always goes in the direction opposite the motion of the block. So as the block's going down the ramp, friction's going to act and pull upwards as well. So four forces acting on this block, two of them pointing up the ramp, gravity going straight down, and normal force perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so now we have a free body diagram, and now we get to our derivations. Um, now, for the derivations, you may not have seen this on too many of your AP1 questions to date, um, but there are a lot of times where it talks about you have to do something in certain terms. And what that means for us is that our answer can have and can only have those specific symbols in it. I can't have tension in there because it's not one of my options. I can't have mu in there because it's not one of my options. I can't have... Oh, I don't know, capital M in there because it's not one of my options. Everything I do for this question has to only be in terms of M1, M2, G, theta, and F. All right. So that being said, let's go through this question now and try to figure out the coefficient of kinetic friction between the plane and block one. All right. Well, coefficient of kinetic friction, this is uh, pretty nice because I only know of one single equation that deals with coefficient of kinetic friction. And that is FF, well, I can spell right, FF equals mu FN. The force of friction equals mu times my normal force. All right, now in this case, I didn't put in the less than or equals sign, like your reference tables has it, because we have kinetic friction. And kinetic friction is always a constant value um, unlike static, which can vary up to a certain point. So equals here because we're talking about kinetic friction going on there, and that lets us solve this. So the force of friction, well, they told me that. That's F. That's easy. So little f equals mu sub k. And now I need to find the normal force. Well, the normal force, just like in our previous problem, if we were to jump back here, this must be the perpendicular part of the weight of the block. So as we go through this, my block's weight is M1G. And the perpendicular part, the part pulling down right here for this is M1G. 
and we are adjacent to our angle as I draw this out. So therefore, we're going to use cosine. So the normal force is M1G cos theta. And that's about all I can simplify. I can't put in numbers or anything like that. So let's just solve this for mu. Well, that means I'm dividing everything here over the other side. And I'll get mu k equals f divided by m1g cos theta. And now that we've got that, let's just double check, make sure we're happy with all our rules here. M1's in my equation, m 2 is not, g is, theta is, and f is, and there's nothing else in there that's not one of those terms. So that means we are good to go. Okay. Every once in a while, you get to a point and say, well, I still have other terms uh, or something I need to sub out. That's a good clue that we need to use a different equation or something like that to make it work in there. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, the second part of this, part C, determine the value of the suspended mass, capital M, that allows the blocks one and two to move with a constant velocity down the plane. So how big is this guy that lets those blocks slide down at a constant speed? All right, well, again, we have this wonderful term, constant velocity, which means that we can say, without a doubt, all the parallel forces on the ramp must cancel out to be zero. Okay? And I know M1, or capital M here is going vertical, but this pulley changes the direction of the force. So really I'm saying that this tension in this cord is caused by the weight of the block and therefore it's going to be pulling it downwards, uh, pulling it up the plane in there. So I'm gonna talk about parallel and perpendicular, even though this one is going vertically, it's putting a parallel force on there. All right, so because they all equal zero, all the forces going up the ramp must cancel out all the forces going down the ramp. Okay. So looking at this, um, let's for the sake of here, I think I'm going to say, we got to pick a pick a direction here. Let's say all the things going down the ramp are positive forces and all the things going up the ramp are negative forces. This is just my preference. You could choose to flip flop the signs. It's not going to make a difference in our answer. Both are going to work equally well. All right, so I'm going to start with all the forces going down the ramp here. And there are two forces on this thing that are going down the ramp. There's part of the weight of M1 that pulls down the ramp, and there's part of the weight of M2 that pulls down the ramp. Using the same right triangle trig that we did before, this means that we can say, let's hold this up for a second, that we have M1 G sine theta, opposite part pulling down the ramp, plus M2 G sine theta, pulling down the ramp. Those are both positive terms. Now we got to talk about the ones going up the ramp. Well, the question specifically mentions friction and friction. Both those would oppose the direction of motion and go up the ramp. So minus F, minus 2F. And then finally, we have the tension in the string from the weight of the block here. So minus big MG all has to equal zero. And that's pretty much where we need to go. We can simplify a little bit here. I can factor out an M or a G sine theta out of these terms, and I can combine my Fs together. So that's nice. So I'll have G sine theta times M1 plus M2 minus three F. And I guess let's get MG over the other side because that's what I want to solve for here equals big M G. And now the last step, let's divide everything by G. So I'll have sine theta M1 plus M2 minus three F over G equals the mass of my block. And that's where we have to leave it. We can't really simplify much more and we've got it solved for our answer. Let's just double check again, making sure we're only using our appropriate terms. Um, M1, M2, G, theta, and F, nothing else added in there. So everything else um, matches up nicely. So that one looks good as well. All right, so there's this question, question number two done. All right, 
Um, we probably have time for a couple more. So let me go dig through my pile here, and we'll find a, a more straightforward one. Okay. Um, how about this one? This one, another APB question, um, but very indicative of the sort of starting questions for a lot of these things. Okay. Here we've got a monkey. And the monkey is hanging at rest from two vines, A and B, as shown above. Each of the vines is 10 meters long and doesn't really have any mass that we care about. On the figure below, we should draw and label all the forces acting on the monkey. Okay, so how many forces act on the monkey? Well, the monkey should have three forces acting on him. And these should be in no particular order. We should have gravity going straight down, and G. We should have a tension going up this way. I'm going to call that TB. And we should have a tension going off in this general direction. I'll call that TA. All right, so there's three forces right there. Um, do notice that a lot of these questions are going to say something like this. Don't do the components. Only do the entire forces on there. Don't worry about TAX and TAY or anything like that on there. They want to know for a free body diagram the entire whole forces. We have to do. We may have to break them up into components later on, but this is exactly what they're looking for right now. All right, part B. Determine the tension in the vine while the monkey is sitting at rest. All right. So again, we have these words at rest. We know all the forces must cancel each other out. They must be equal to zero. So this means all the vertical forces must cancel out. And it also means all the horizontal forces must cancel out. Right? Both those statements must be true when the monkey's at rest. We're not accelerating up and down, nor are we accelerating side to side. All right, so let's start with, let's start with the vertical. So the vertical says all the up forces must equal all the down forces. Well, looking at this, my monkey has an upward force from TA. I'm going to call it TAY. And there's also an upward force on TB. I'm going to call that TBY. So I will say TAY plus TBY has to equal the weight of our monkey, okay? Um, and I guess we'll, we'll do the X ones too, since we can here. There's only two horizontal forces. I've got TAX and I've got TBX. And those two forces must cancel each other out just to make it B equal to zero. So TAX must be equal to the tension in B horizontally. Okay, well, that's great. There's our, there's our starting problem or questions right there. But I need to expand this. So this is where we need to do some trig. This is a 30 degree angle and this is a 60 degree angle. So looking at this monkey, TAY is opposite my angle. So TAY must be the tension in A times the sine of 30 degrees plus TBY, same sort of thing, tension in B, we are opposite the angle, so TB sine 60. And all that must be equal to the weight of our monkey. Um, our goal here is to find TB. So the big problem here is I have a TA over here that I need to get rid of. To do that, we're going to look at our horizontal stuff, get an equation over here that is TA equals something, and do a system of equations. Solve this for TA, plug it back in here, and then solve for TB. So for this, horizontal part of A is adjacent to my angle. So that's TA cos 30 equals TB, same sort of thing, TB adjacent to the angle cos 60. All right, and that would mean that TA equals TB cos 60 over cos 30. 
And now we can take this one, slide it over, and we can plug it in. And this does get messier before it gets better. Um, if this was a question you got on a test or an exam, at this point, you could plug this all in your calculator. And if you've got a CAS or something like that, that can end solve or um, do some solving, that works great. You could graph these parts and show where the two um, curves intersect and that has to be your right answer. Um, there's lots of ways you could do it. But we're going to do it algebraically, which means this gets messy, then we'll clean it up at the end here. So this is TB sine 30. Cos 60 all over cos 30 plus TB sine 60 equals mg. I'm going to factor a TB out of both these things because it shows up in both these terms. So this is sine 30 cos 60 over cos 30 oops, plus sine 60 equals mg. And then I guess this is where we could put these all in the calculator, come up with an answer and go from there. Or we can, yeah, I guess I can simplify too. Sine over cosine is tangent. So let me divide all this mess over the other side and I'll get the tension in B equals mg divided by tan 30 cos 60 plus sine 60. What a mess that is. And now we'll plug in numbers here, since we have numbers to work with. Uh, the monkey's mass is five kilograms. Uh, tangent of 30 is 0.58. Cos of 60 is 0.5. And sine of 60 is 0.87. So we plug all those things in there, and we will get a, a tension in B of 43.1 newtons for our tension in the vine. Okay. Um, so here's another example of doing equilibrium. This one, we had to do two different directions, X and Y, and do a system of equations to solve through the rest. Um, that one also is fairly common. Most of the time, you're going to do it without numbers, so you'll be left with trig sort of stuff, which isn't ideal, but also isn't that bad to deal with, as long as you're careful about um, keeping track of your thetas and stuff like that there. And I had one more I was going to do. Yeah. I guess this last one, in a very similar vein, we will um, wrap up today with the most modern of my questions so far, uh, 2005B2. And this is a simple pendulum, consists of a bob with a mass of 1.8 kilograms attached to a string of length 2.3 meters. The pendulum's held at a 30-degree angle from their vertical by a light horizontal string, as shown above. Uh, do a free body diagram, and then calculate the tension in the string. All right, so on our bob, we've got gravity pulling down. Well, totally out of focus. Come back in. We've got, I'm going to call it TX, a horizontal friction going on, or horizontal tension going on. And then we've got our last one, which is, uh, I guess I'll just call it T for that, actually, let me make this TH for horizontal, because I'm going to end up with an X and a Y for this one, so I don't want to confuse. So TH, the horizontal tension, gravity going down, and this tension going up there, and this is a 30-degree angle on there. All right, part B, calculate the tension in the horizontal string. So let's run through some numbers with this. This one, basically, we say, okay, this bob is, you guys can't see that, um, this bob is held at an angle. It's not moving. It's stuck in place. Equilibrium rules apply. All of my vertical forces must equal zero, and all of my horizontal forces must equal zero. They must cancel each other out because we're not accelerating up or down or anything like that. All right, so vertical forces, there's really only two of them. I've got some part of tension, I'm going to call it TY, is vertical, and I've got gravity being vertical, and that's it. So the vertical tension in the string must be equal to the weight of the ball. Well, what about horizontal? I also have two horizontal tensions. I've got 
some horizontal part of the tension here, and I've got the horizontal strain. So I can simply say that TH must equal TX, and TH, the horizontal strain, that's what we're looking for in this question. All right, so let's expand these out a little bit more. TY, vertical part here, now notice my angle is different. Last time we had the angle up in this corner, we had to use opposite. Here, the angle's in the bottom section, we use adjacent. So TY is T cos 30 equals MG. And now for TX, now we are opposite our angle, so we're using sine. So this is T sine 30, okay? Being careful when we do these questions through, keeping an eye on where your angle is. Are we talking about opposite or adjacent? Um, there's no nice rule of thumb anymore because they can give you any angle they want to give you um, for these questions. So let's do the same sort of process. I'm going to solve this for T, plug it into this one, and solve for TH. So T equals MG over cos 30. And then we plug that into here. So the horizontal tension is mg over cos 30 times the sine of 30. Well, that is mg sine over cosine mg tan 30. Okay, and then we have numbers in the question. So they tell us the mass is 1.8. So that means mg 1.8 times 10, so 18 tan 30 or approximately 10.4 newtons for our tension in the string. And again, this very common sort of question that you will see on the AP, um, maybe even some sort of combination between this style and the very first ones that we talked about. We'll have some kids make some claims about the tensions. I think T is bigger than TH and here's why, dot, dot, dot then what do you agree with on that kid's statement? What do you disagree with? Support it with free body diagrams, support it with math, and then have some reasoning part to it too. So very possible that shows up as a um, free response question for the qualitative quantitative problems. All right, but at this time, it's about five minutes to eight. So I think we're gonna wrap the stream up. Thank you guys for watching. And if you have any questions, um, please let us know. Uh, follow Fiveable at social media, at Fiveable, on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, all those wonderful social media things. And I uh, hope to see you guys on the next stream. Thanks. Good night.